welcome back to ESG Decoded. I'm your host, Caitlin Allen, and today I am really excited to welcome back Bill Davis to the podcast. Uh, Bill has been a fan favorite. His um, first episode is uh, one of the most popular of all time, and we re-released it as a fan favorite last year, and um, it did almost just as well as the first time. So we know people are really interested in your work, Bill. I'm so happy to have you back on the pod. Thank you for returning. Caitlin, great to see you again, and thanks for having me back on the pod. One of the reasons I wanted to get back with you specifically is since we released our first episode, there's been, of course, a lot of of the hullabaloo and controversy about, about what we do in ESG. Um, and I'm just curious, how have you been thinking about the debate? What have you learned? Any sort of changes in how you think about um, what you do at Stance Capital? Yeah, sure. Good question. And it's certainly, um, I think it's an important sort of macro thing that's going on right now. Actually, let me kind of back out of that for a second and just explain kind of how what ESG was really intended to be, because I think it's actually um, it's really kind of getting stretched in directions that really, in a way, makes nobody happy. You know, there's people who are sort of against it and they think that it's something that it really isn't. I think that there's people who are for it and wish that it would become something that it probably isn't destined to become. And so it might be good to start by just trying to kind of reground it a little bit. So look, the idea of investors um, seeking to gain an edge, either from a performance standpoint, or in, I'd say in this case, most likely sort of a risk mitigation standpoint is not a new idea. It's been around for 20, 30 uh, years or more. And really like all ESG was intended to be was a bunch of data, uh, and by the way, that nobody really agreed upon exactly what the data was, but just a bunch of different data sets that investors could use to ascertain risk. I mean, that's kind of what it was. And I would say I'm very guilty because I created a product nine years ago uh, and referred to it as an ESG product. Your podcast has the name ESG in it. And in many ways, I think that you, what you're doing is more true to the origins or the intent of ESG in some way even than what I'm doing, because really what we're trying to do is practice what I would describe as values aligned investing, which is to say that we believe that there are certain risks to investors, particularly but not exclusively around a changing climate um, that is going to affect you know, like every human on earth, and it's going to affect every business, every enterprise on earth uh, as well in different ways. And there's going to be winners and losers as countries and economies and individual businesses seek to decarbonize their business models because they are, in fact, doing that. I mean, that's not controversial. It's it's sort of taking place. And so as a portfolio manager, what we're really looking to do is identify what we think some of those risks are and in essence, protect clients against those risks, but also at the same time to identify opportunities and expose them to those opportunities. So like, you know, like I think I said this a year ago, Caitlin, I believe that if practiced properly, this is really non-controversial, non-denominational, it's just another approach to managing portfolios. And one, by the way, where we think that we can outperform the market with less risk. You know, like having said all of that, I get that there are different points of view on values alignment. You know, like one of the problems with values alignment is it's very personal, right? So my values are different than yours and, and both of them are different from, you know, two thirds of the people who listen to this pod. and so. It's very much in the eye of the beholder. And I'll just, I think I'll just pause right there and just get your reaction. Yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. Our, our goal with ESG Decoded was and has been to highlight those ESG issues and how companies are dealing with them, how capital markets are trying to price the risk of these issues 
the frameworks you mentioned, you know, originally is meant to be data points that we can all com compare um, and have some comparability among companies. So certainly we've taken a more agnostic um, view of ESG at, in terms of the removing the values piece and really focusing on the risk and opportunity. Um, so I think that's fair. And I think it's interesting that, you know, any type of um, pushback controversy is great for a movement to think about and reflect on, you know, get more specific about what we do. And I think your um, point about values-based is maybe one of the key differentiators in a way of, of what a sort of an ESG risk screen might be versus, um, you know, hey, it's th these are my values and I'm trying to make a return while investing according to my own values. So I think that's a really important distinction you're making um, and hopefully helps a lot of people think through this because, you know, there's, to your point, a lot of these newer ETFs or products that are coming out that are attempting to, quote, be anti-ESG, like, they actually are ESG. It's just a different, a different issue screen that they're doing, or a different values-based issue screen that they're doing. So really, all of it is that's become controversial is more values-based and conflicts of values versus having anything to do with ESG itself, which in and of itself is agnostic. Yeah, that's exactly, that's that's very well put and. I would say that a ESG in some ways, or the values aligned investing is in some ways an artifact of the way in which brands are infiltrating. Um, well, they've always inf infiltrated everyday lives, but now that's kind of migrated over to investment portfolios. The idea being, look, if you don't want um, Coca-Cola in your refrigerator, you might also not want it in your investment portfolio because of whatever reason, you're worried about obesity, you think it's just a bunch of sugar, like it really doesn't matter what the issue is. And so I think that that is happening everywhere and, uh, and it's gonna continue to happen. And I think in some ways, you know, like the other side of the equation is companies and how they think about all of these things, right? And so in many cases, I think, it's not so much that investors are bullying companies into changing their behavior, although some of that is absolutely happening. I would say that equally important is this sort of enlightened self-interest on the part of public companies that they are, yes, they need to answer to their shareholders, but there are also other stakeholders that are equally important to them, right? So employees, right? Something like 60% of the U.S. workforce is going to be millennial or Gen Z starting in about three years. I mean, that's like pretty extraordinary, right? And as a younger generation has slightly different values than say their parents, companies need to modify their own behavior in order to reflect those values, either in the products that they're building the ways in which they're building those products like supply chain and you know all of that as well as they're also thinking about future workforce as well and so i think all of this is kind of there's this big dance going on and everybody's trying to figure out how they feel about it but at the end of the day um it's not going away and despite i think a lot of you know, efforts to turn it into sort of a political wedge issue. I don't really think it is. And I don't think that that's, you know, it gets a lot of headlines, but I think, you know, in general, investors are much more focused on other things like performance than they are with whether or not, you know, BlackRock should be able to, you know, market its bond offerings in the state of Texas. I mean, I just think that it's, it's, it's such an obscure thing to most people. On this note, um, of values-based investing. You know, there's also this, I suppose, assessment by um, a lot of very important institutions that um, some of these macro issues really are bad for the economy or are major risks to business, to economic stability. Um, some of those being social instability, 
um, weakness of democracy. I know that's something you're working on recently, so would love to um, switch to that topic and hear a little bit about that. Yeah, um, happy to. So I think I mentioned this when I was on last time, and I'm just going to cover it really quickly. But this idea of off balance sheet risk factors is not static. I mean, there's things that happen in the world that we need to think about and we need to react to as portfolio managers, or at least that's how we view our job at Stance Capital. Um, one of them happened during COVID, and that was we noticed, and you know, we're very good in general at protecting against downside risk, and we did during COVID. One of the things that we noticed is that there are certain screens that were never really intended to be resilient in the face of a pandemic. And so we basically asked ourselves, like, what could we do to improve our screening process? And one of the things that we noticed is that in certain sectors of the economy, paid sick leave is not, it's just not on the table. It's not available to workers. And so without, you know, turning this into a moral argument for why that should not be the case, the thing that we said is, is it a risk to performance if in certain industries and sub-industry groups, um, there's no paid sick leave in the, in the face of a pandemic? And the answer is yes, because what ends up happening is if you can't afford to not go to work, you're going to come back to work with COVID. And then you're going to get a bunch of other people sick and a bunch of people getting sick working in close proximity tends to equal the plant shutting down, which tends to mean that the company is going to miss its numbers. And you can sort of see the rest of the story. And so we actually added that as a risk factor. And then to your question specifically, I've been thinking about this for about a year, but we actually kind of put it into action at the end of last year. And it's now part of our uh, portfolio within um, STNC, which is our the ticker symbol for our ETF. We basically questioned whether or not public companies should be spending shareholder profits effectively um, in support of politicians that have varying agendas. And, you know, <laughs> this is like, uh, if you're a public company, you are getting hit up by every single politician at a local, state, federal level. And chances are you're writing a check to everybody because that's kind of what happens. And if you actually look at political contributions and there are ways to actually track this stuff, whether it's through PACs or direct contributions or contributions from key employees and, and decision makers, you can sort of see kind of this pattern repeating itself. You know, like personally, I would love to see no money in politics because not as a political issue, but as a shareholder um, issue. However, the thing that we noticed is that, you know, we had an election in 2020. Um, it was by all, I think, accounts a free and fair election. And yet, um, quite a large number of elected officials refused to certify the results of that election, uh, which they are required to do, um, you know, as a result of the electoral college process. And they're very identifiable, identifiable individuals. And so we began working with an NGO that actually, uh, it's called opensecrets.org. It's based in DC. And they actually track political contributions. And the thing that we noticed is that some companies went out of their way to actually disproportionately support politicians who were, you know, sort of what I would describe as anti-democratic. And I mean, democratic with a um, not referring to the political party, but the idea of democracy as being sort of the underpinning of our society. And so, you know, look, I guess my personal view is at a macro level that a badly functioning or a dysfunctional democracy is not in shareholders' best interest. So that's one piece of it. But I think the other piece of it is that, you know, we are entering, I think, a phase where we're not going to be looking at 20%, 30% up years in the stock market anytime soon. And I think little things are going to have a huge effect on companies' performance. And so if you're a consumer-facing company and you hold yourself up as having uh, 
very high standards from an environmental standpoint in terms of good governance, in terms of supporting local communities. And yet you become seen as an organization that really went out of its way to write large checks in many different ways, or I should say to get money in many different ways through PACs and other means into the hands of politicians that are seeking to undermine those things. I don't think that's very good for that business from a shareholder perspective. And I think ultimately it can lead to, um, you know, based on what I said earlier about increasingly there being stakeholders like employees and like customers who care about these issues quite a bit. It's not good for companies to be seen as being in that business of, of undermining democracy. And so one of the things that we introduced in our portfolio at the beginning of this year were some, what we call them red flag screens, which means that in and of itself, it's not going to knock a company out of consideration to be in our portfolio, but it's going to apply a point deduction, which is going to render that company unlikely to be in the portfolio. So maybe in some ways it's saying, I'm sort of saying the same thing, but we actually introduce those screens. Right now we're doing it at a federal politician level, and we also have the data to take it down to the state level, which gets a little bit more nuanced because I recognize, you know, one of the data patterns that we've seen is that companies that tend to be state regulated, so an example would be a healthcare company or perhaps a telecom company, are probably more sensitive to local political issues uh, than they would otherwise need to be. And so we're still in the process of thinking about how we want to structure you know, decisions as it relates to state level campaign contributions. But we think it's we think it's an interesting thing to do. And, you know, we're going to continue to do it moving forward. For a lot of um, fund managers or or companies pre creating products that broadly fall under Yeshi, but in this case fall under a values based investing. It's interesting to hear about the extensive analysis and thought process that goes into designing something like this. So hearing about where um, you have to source, you know, you have to source data, you have to, um, you're trying to put a scoring system on like kind of all of the back end of how something like this is created, I think is really interesting whether or not someone agrees fundamentally with the the value i think it's it's really interesting to hear the other thing i wanted to point out was you know it kind of reminds me of an another episode we did last year with rick alexander so if people are interested in this check out that episode because he you know he really has this thesis really that by undermining like the I'm not going to say as well structured, <laughs> but by undermining um, sort of macro issues that affect everyone and affect markets more broadly, when when an individual company is incentivized for the short term profit and to basically prioritize that over the 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 macro stability of the economy or the macro stability of a democracy of a government. Um, you know, that's in conflict. And so he's trying to articulate why, you know, companies, shareholders should care about supporting or not supporting democratic or anti-democratic values, um, because it uh, essentially ends up affecting all boats, so to speak. Uh, the And it's not going to be a rising tide if we move toward authoritarianism in the world. It's going to be a it's going to be real bad <laughs> for for um, for economies and for financial stability. So I think that's another thing I'm hearing is paralleling that where it, it's it's yes, it's about the company and about its share, shareholders and individual stakeholders, but also what this macro picture. And you know, you mentioned earlier quantifying climate related risk. That's the whole point of the task force on climate related financial disclosures, the TCFD, which is. Again, I've said it on here a million times that it's a task force of the Financial Stability Board of the G20. It's the whole, this is, it's not NGOs, right? Like this is the people in charge of our pensions and our 401ks and wanting to see that stability 
um, in markets. And so it's that recognition, I think growing recognition and understanding that the macro environment um, matters. It matters for everybody to make money um, and to remain stable, essentially. It's much bigger than, you know, Bill's anti-democracy screen at Stance Capital. I think that's a wonderful example of it. Um, but it's, I think it's this bigger awakening for people to really realize that the, the macro system matters for your investments, just period. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I also think something that's a little bit tangentially related to that, which is not too long ago, people just thought, okay, I need stock market exposure. I'm going to buy the S&P. I'm going to buy a passive fund. I'm going to get that exposure. I think that's kind of increasingly risky these days, partly because of, you know, that well, take the S&P itself. It's a market cap weighted index, which means that the largest companies from a, from a market cap standpoint, um, enjoy the biggest percentage, you know, of the index. So it's kind of gotten to the point where at the beginning of 2022, I think six companies accounted for 25% of the S and P 500. Right. And so, you know, and those companies, we, we all know them. They're all the big mega cap names like Tesla and Apple and Alphabet and Amazon and so forth. And by the way, the S and P was down 18 and change last year. I think that there is a real role for active management and active management, you know, used to mean, okay, that means I'm going to do research on individual companies, whether technical research or fundamental research, and I'm going to develop a point of view and all these other things. I think increasingly, like you're almost crazy as an investor, if you're not thinking about some of these externalities that could affect performance. And I also think that active management, there's a real role for active management in this increasingly complicated world with shorter and shorter cycles and, you know, just more risk in general. You know, I had a conversation with um, somebody recently and they said, well, you know, I'm kind of at the point where I only want to do business with people who think exactly like me. And I don't really agree with that. Like, I think that my job is, you know, look, I, look, I'm a human being and I have, you know, biases and I have, and I vote, you know, the way I vote. However, I think the reality is, is people, when it comes to money management, ought to be thinking about who's doing the best job of thinking about this, like a multidimensional chess game, who is going to do a best job of protecting my assets in a down market and is going to think about risk in some orthogonal ways, because that's the way in which risk is going to end up biting us, I think. And, you know, not to put in too big of a plug for our ETF, but, you know, last year, the S&P was down 18 something. We were down 12 something. Maybe you're not all that worried about climate, but the reality is, is we're doing more in portfolio construction than just thinking about climate. We're also thinking about how to weigh, you know, how to weight names in a portfolio in order to minimize tail risk and create as much independence as possible. So look, I think um, this thing called ESG or values aligned investing or whatever people choose to call it is not going away. It has become, become more and more prevalent um, in, in, you know, like many directions, right? Because just as I'm, my values you know, imply a portfolio in a, that goes in a certain direction. There's other portfolio managers that have different values that are building portfolios that go in other directions. And at the end of the day, the free market is going to determine, you know, like winners and losers in this process. But, you know, in the meantime, it is not, it's not simple. It's not a simple process. There are lots of macro issues that need to kind of get considered as well as um, more, you know, sort of day-to-day -day issues, just like, you know, thinking about the concentration risk in the S&P 500 is an example of one of them. Yeah, no, I think super insightful, Bill. Thank you so much um, for joining us again. I know that the audience um, clearly loves Bill Davis, <laughs> wants to hear um, what you think about these things. So I'm really grateful you came back to share your perspectives. Again, as always, we'll have links for our resource boost in the chat if you want to check out more uh, about Stance Capital.
I guess we'll see you again next time, Bill. Thanks for joining. I look forward to it. Thanks so much, Caitlin. Thank you.